All right, very good. Okay. <laughs> so this is what we discussed last time about how the project works. I will give you the rubric, but I uploaded the rubric and then I deleted it because it needs some some clarification on the rubric page. So is this is this helpful? And then this will be in the uh, Lion and Winter folder. So if we're Mm. Okay, that's not, that wasn't exactly the last thing. Sorry, I have to go back to modules. And you know, you can collapse your modules so that you just see, if you only see the headlines, you're not having to scroll through the whole thing. Okay. And this is what we discuss, we're discussing this week. This is our midterm, and then here's line in winter. So if you collapse things, then you're just looking at the, the major headlines and they go by week, and you can follow that easily. So here it is, line in winter costume design project and the whiteboard discussion. And then everything else for line in winter will be on this page. There will be pages, and then there will be an assignment. And on the assignment page, I will put a, a checklist that will review everything that should be included in that project, okay? Does that, how does that organization sound for you guys? Because everyone accesses the information differently. So I wanna make sure that the information is good for you. Thank you for that, thumbs up. Do I have any other um, feedback? That's good. Go ahead, Diego. Oh, you said sounds good? Yeah. Okay, so uh, we had a discussion on the concept statement last time, and I would like to spend just about five minutes. I'll send you in a breakout room and we will have a discussion on concept statement for Lion and Winter. So what you'll do is you will Let's see how many we have. You're going to go into a room. There will be two or three of you. And you can discuss the concept statement for Lion and Winter. Just talk about the theme, how you can come up with really a very nice statement. And I'll visit.
This is our COVID. Probably nobody. I just thought if I, if I thought, oh, I Hi. We're having a little bit of trouble in like the direction to go. Like, is it just like, we started with a story about a royal family and deciding who's going to take over the throne. The story involves Henry, his wife, Eleanor, and- hey, Too much information. I I oh, okay. okay. We were overthinking it. So <laughs> the difference is, what's the difference between plot and the overarching action of the play or the theme? Don't tell me who does what to whom. Okay, that that is not, the, that is not your concept statement. Your concept statement re refers directly to what is this story about? So if you filled in the blank, this story is about, try that. Like the royal family having, like yes. fighting over the next, in, the next in line or like? Okay, what is that, Sam, when you're saying that royal family has a conflict over the next in line? What is that? You're giving me a definition. What's the word? Like, like the definition of moving another royal into the position of power or? Okay, now you're talking. Power struggle. Oh, okay. Right? 
is this play about a power struggle? This story is about a power struggle. Uh, okay. Right? So okay. that's a, that's a, a concept is universal. It's not unique to this particular play. It's something everybody can tap into. It is a, um, it's something that, you know, we all can feel. So you can say, and then you can flesh out this power struggle because it is between a family, which makes it much more personal. So it's love and hate. And how do we, how can we step on people? Okay, I don't want to talk to you about that. You guys need to start talking about that. <laughs> Does that help? But is it just, it's like literally a sentence? It, it's not well, like- You can give me some backup to that. Okay. Why, why do you feel it is this? So okay. it should be three sentences. Okay. And, then, and then your concept statement about that is how you are going to visually represent that. Okay. Does that make sense? Okay, I'm gonna write that down and I'm going to uh, share it with everybody. Okay. I'm gonna go to another room. Colby, are you guys done in room two, you and Diego? Yeah. Okay, so you should be able to tell me your concept and you should be able to fill in this story is about and then give me two or three sentences that ex ex describe how you're gonna visualize that, right? Okay. All right. So, um, so this story is really about codependency. Hold on. Okay. So first of all, Diego, let me tell you something about Colby. Colby's very strong and he wants you to convince that his way is right, okay? So you can have a very different opinion than he is. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right, so you don't have to agree that it's about codependency. You can come up with a different theme for yourself. You don't have mm -hmm. to agree between you. What I'm trying to ta have you talk about is different kinds of things. What was your idea about this story is about? Uh, I, I did agree with him because one thing he did say, it's about, you know, um, a theme uh, in this story is uh, about how people do it, um, anything to get, you know, higher power. And okay. So that's different. Yeah. What you're talking about, Diego, is power. That's yeah. different than codependency. Oh, oh, okay. okay, I didn't know what codependency actually meant. Oh, see, really, really good to you. You gotta, you gotta speak up. You're a smart kid, and you have a lot to offer. So that's why yeah. I wanted to just say, Colby's always gonna. He's he's always going to jump in there he loves discussion he's really you know into that so don't be afraid and this is why we're doing this is don't be afraid to say you know i don't really understand codependency but this is my thought is it's this kind of thing okay yeah okay perf yeah. so then that's this story is about and you fill in your blank about what it is for you it might be about power and then for Colby, it's gonna be about codependency. And that should be something that everyone can tap into. 
So all your audience can understand that. And certainly everybody in your design team understands that. It's universal. And then what you wanna do is you wanna have your supporting statements, two or three sentences that say, this is how the design is gonna show this idea. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then you guys talk about that right now. You can stay in this room, talk about how your idea can sh be shown through the design. Think about your design elements, use your design elements. Like the design for like costume design, like how the costumes will look, is that what you mean? You use your design elements. So it might be how the costumes will look, you know? Think about what the design elements are. What are the ones we've talked about? I'm gonna just, I have a couple more rooms to go to and then we're gonna have this, we're gonna come back for the bigger discussion. You guys just stay here, okay? Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm just gonna go join this room and then, so I have a couple and I'll come back. So you guys, okay. you're clear on how you wanna kind of go. You're not gonna copy each other. You're not gonna get the same statement, right? You're gonna do your own statement because you're gonna do your own drawings. You have your own design idea. Okay? Okay. Awesome. Green and she's a light green. Yeah. Sounds like you guys are too specific. Now you're talking about color. Oh, well, I, were we just supposed to talk about the, so the themes? Here's, here's the, uh, just to refine, it, we're, we're still talking about the maximum, the macro view, right? Okay. Which is, this story is about, it's like one sentence. It's about this universal truth. So what did you guys, if I said this story is about Cassandra, what would you say? I'd say family and power. Okay, Josephine, what would you say? Uh, yeah, kind of like. Don't copy, just say your own thing. Yeah, well, I think the same. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Kit, what do you think? Like shifting power dynamics. Okay, shift in power. So that's what you're gonna put here. And you're all going to have something different because when you present, you're going to present your own opinion. And that's what I wanted you to synthesize down. Then you have to do a supporting statement or multiple about how the design will show this universal thing and use your design elements. You don't need to talk specifically, but you can talk about the design elements of line, texture, color, you know, those things. How can you show those things? So it's a kind of an abstract discussion right now, but it's gonna, it's trying to help you to get to something where you can talk about the green sleeve or whatever, mm -hmm. right? Well, we but don't talk that detailed now. Each person wants to have their own bent on this. And as soon as I get to the other room, I'm bringing everybody back. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah. So Josephine, don't, don't copy what they say. You have to have your own opinion and you need to take things out of the script and tell me why. But so we, we need to cite it? Yeah. Uh, totally You're muted, Pam. Are you, yeah. yeah. That's a relief. Did I close the breakout rooms? No, okay. No, yeah. no but yeah, I think they... No, no, never mind. It's not yet. Just, they should, well, I mean, the whiteboard thing was really helpful. Okay, how are you guys doing? Pretty good. Are we supposed to be reviewing the concept for the play? Yes. So this is what, this is what I, I want you to say this story is about, mm -hmm. and it should be a universal theme not the plot. So, okay. uh, and then you want to tell me how the design will show that. Okay. Okay. And I'm going to call okay. you back in a second. All right. Let me go back. Uh. Uh, I do. Uh, what, what was another thing you came up with? And uh... oh, hello. Hi. Hello. 
Okay. So, uh, Aspen, is this your room? No. No, okay. this is Sue. Sue, okay. So this story is about, it's a universal statement, it's not a plot. And then how the design supports that. I'm gonna close the breakout rooms. So talk about that just for a minute. Okay. And then uh, I will come back and see you. Okay. What was it about? I'm sorry, sorry, see that again? So you're gonna do, this story is about. Okay, okay, okay. And then you're gonna tell me, this is your concept statement, okay? Okay. Okay, so Aspen, you know, the script was due, you had to, it was, you should have read it two weeks ago. So we're having a discussion now and I'm, that's why I'm concerned that you haven't read it yet. So can you, so this is, this is not gonna make any sense to you because you have to have the, you have to have the script read in order to have this discussion. Yeah, no, it's, it, I get that you have to focus on everything, trust me. I, do I really wanna be spending at least, you know, 40 hours a week outside of all my 20 hours of Zoom classes to try and get things ready? No, but you know what? You, you, it's hard. It's really hard. So um, time management is the most important thing to learn in life, actually. So if you haven't read the script, you can't understand what this assignment's about. I'm going to call the, I'm going to close the rooms and I'll see you guys in a minute. Let's see. Pam, you're muted. I always think that's a good thing. Okay. So is everybody back? Let me just take a look here. We're waiting for just a couple more people to come. So it, I'm really glad we did this because there was a wide variety of both question and information about what is the concept statement, okay? And this is how you can develop your concept statement and your concept statement is individual. So even though you're in a room where one person had a great idea and you're thinking, yeah, that's an idea, you need to make it your idea. And you may have the same idea as someone else, absolutely. But here's where the change will happen, okay? The concept statement answers, this story is about, and that's a universal truth. It's something universal. It is not the plot. So the plot is, this happens, this happens, this happens, right? There's a family, they have a fight, there's three sons, there's a, there is a mistress, there's this. Okay, that's the plot. Who does what to whom is the plot? That can inform your, your theme, but it's not the theme. It's, the, it's what happens in the play. So the overarching theme of the play is the answer to this story is about this thing. Then you're gonna give, it's really, this is a, like a three sentence thing because you're gonna do it in your oral presentation. You're gonna tell us what it's about. So your supporting statement is how the design will show and reinforce this universal truth and you're gonna use your design elements. You can cite the script because this dialogue is all you have to go on and the dialogue, just one or two statements of dialogue where Henry says, can really support your idea for the theme and can support the reason why you are showing these things in the design. Does that make sense to everybody? Is that helpful for the concept statement? Uh, yeah. Yes. Yes? Yeah. Okay. Do you 
want us to cite it in our concept statement when we like when we present this like i don't know when we well, say yeah for example like, you can just say um i'm gonna make something up right now okay so i'll say okay. sorry can you take the thin man as an example when i make something up right now yeah I no, i'm not going to give it to you <laughs> you have to think oh, of it yourself okay. I mean, that's the thing here. Here's the, here's the problem with being a designer. It's not ever been done before. You're making up something. The reason why you get hired as a designer is because of what you bring to the table. So what I mean by that is your, what do you bring to the table as a designer? Right now, nothing. No, that's not true, Kara. That is so not true. I mean, creative ingenuity. You bring yourself. That's right. So if that's your creative ingenuity, you know, it's you bring yourself. It's it's what your thought is. You know, if there's if they're interviewing three designers and you come and you show your portfolio and it's like blah blah blah. Okay, great. Why are they going to hire me over somebody else? because of either something that I've said about the material that we're working on, something that they saw in a portfolio. And so that's why the, so example kit, that's why the, the line that you pick out of the play can really indicate why you've made this kind of a design choice. And by the way, I've decided the final is going to be the final project will be Midsummer Night's Dream. I've gone back and forth and I just said, we're doing that. It's just much more clear. So let me pick. Oh, I don't want to pick something out of Lion in Winter. I think that might be too confusing. Okay, let me pick something out of The Thin Man because we we're done with that project. What did you think The Thin Man was about? We, we were done with that project, so you guys read it. What did you think it was about? A murder, murder mystery. Okay, so this play is about solving for a murder. Is that a... Um, is that an individual thing? What is it? This play is about... It, it, there, is it uh, about that? This play is about the dynamics between a detective and his wife as they solve a murder. So is this play about love? Is it a love story? Mm, not exactly. Because the murder is just a, the murder, it's like when you have a disease, there are symptoms, the murder is just a symptom, right? The murder is just a symptom in this play. It's just, it's just a vehicle to make something happen. And, and what is, huh? Maybe wealth. Like it seems it, it, it's what well, we see a lot of differences in the different dynamics between the wealthy and those that are less well off. So like, uh, I mean, the main reason to kill like, Dorothy's dad, I'm sorry, I don't remember his name, Mr. Wyatt or something. Uh, but my one is like, was in order to get his wealth because like he was, he was getting suspicious. And like a lot of the reasons why people died or like were involved in the plot, like uh, the secretary was because they were involved in like stealing wealth from like someone wealthy. And so that sounds, first of all, it's interesting. The thing that you're bringing up is happens before the play starts right? He's killed before the play starts. Yep. But here's an interesting thing is you're talking about greed. Now, greed is universal. Is that central to the play? Because who are our main characters? Nick and Nora. Nick and Nora. It doesn't necessarily, have, I think it's them having to navigate that world. I think it's less about whether or not they're experiencing those feelings. It, I think it's more like that, 
like innocence versus greed, if you want to use the word greed. Well, it's greed if you want somebody's money. Yeah. And didn't Nick, he he took over her estate pretty much and stopped working himself. Yeah, Nick, yeah. Nick took, when uh, Nora's dad died, Nick got, they were, Nora was already very wealthy, but then Nick was even, Nick sort of inherited wealth, but then Dorothy pushes him to go back to work. I guess you could say that Nora is greedy for adventure and then like Nick is greedy for like just chilling out. And, uh, okay, so then if you want to talk about Nick and Nora, maybe it's not about greed. Oh, I'm just saying like if we had to apply it, I think they are, they, there is definitely a want for that kind of stuff. But I do think it's the reason why I use like wealth and dynamic because it's like we have Dorothy who like is like more new rich like well like it's more like she's just like young and rich and so like she doesn't really know i don't know it's just like naivety and then uh there's nick who like is with nora's money and then there's also like informants that aren't as wealthy and then there's also mimi who's like old rich but like also not quite uh up on her luck so uh let's just say uh, and I'll, you can pick, everyone can pick what they want, right? And normally what you do is the designer would pick and then you have a discussion with the director and the director will make a choice or the director has an idea. And if that's not your idea, then you need to see if your idea can fit in with the director's idea. So I'm gonna pick that, that the thin man is about a competitive love relationship. And I'm gonna show that by showing that, yes, they're very wealthy. Both Nick and Nora are very wealthy. Nick's inherited, so is he new money, but he's a hardworking person and they fell in love somehow even before he had money. But that they're going to be, the dressing will be in layers based on the amount of money that they have. So that will become obvious to the audience. There will also be a color differentiation so that those who are old money may have darker colors and those who have no care in the world will be shown in a more casual attire. They don't need to be as buttoned up because they don't have to prove their wealth. So to show my competitive um, love relationship, I'm going to show what happens when Nora walks into the restaurant and she addresses Nick and says, pretty girl in reference to Dorothy. And Nick says, well, if you like blondes. And Nora says, you've got a type? Nick says, only you darling, lanky brunettes with wicked jaws. Who is she? I was hoping I wouldn't have to tell you. Dorothy's really my daughter. You see, it was spring in Venice. I was so young. I didn't know what I was doing. We are all like that on my father's side. By the way, how is your father's side? Much better, really. Who is she, Nikki? So this is showing a very uh, comfortable, back and forth, sort of competitive one-upsmanship between Nick and Nora, but also coming from a point of view of they don't really have anything to lose. So in answer to the question of your concept statement, yeah, put in a piece of dialogue that that says, you know, this really nails it for me in terms of this kind of concept. And that's, that's, Kit, that's why you have so much discussion about what is the story about. And it's really important that you, in, when you're working in a real collaborative way, that you are supporting what the director's concept is. One time when we did The Heiress, we started out with Katie as a director, she had to leave. We then we had Maggie as a director, she had to leave. And then we had Judy as a director and she stayed in every single one had a completely different idea about what this story was about. And so then you have to kind of be very flexible and wrap your mind around how does this storyline weave and how can I support that storyline? 
because they might take something that's very seemingly inconsequential in a play and have that be what's important. And maybe that works and maybe it'll be a big failure and it might be, but maybe it'll be very big risk and it will be a tremendous success, okay? So we, I will put this into the concept statement page on Lion and Winter. And this, hopefully this discussion informs you about what is a concept statement? How can I make my own choices about this play? Because you're not pleasing me. You're, you, and the th when you go into a design meeting, you're not pleasing someone else. What you're doing is creating an authentic opinion that you have so that you can have a discussion with somebody else if they have a slightly different opinion and see where you can meet either in the middle or if you can give your opinion up and think maybe mine wasn't as well-founded as theirs or I'm gonna embrace their opinion or they're the director, I'm gonna find a way to embrace their opinion. So there's a lot of options that you have to choose from. Does that help? Yes. That's right, Olivia, your idea, your ideas. And then, then you have your research. So what are, and this is helping us with our midterm review, what are the design elements that you can use and how can they show certain kinds of uh, support for a particular theme? So we can, we're gonna speak abstractly now and we're gonna say certain things that doesn't necessarily relate to this specific play. So don't get confused that we're talking about Lion and Winter. We're talking in an abstract way about how design elements can work to help you support your design, okay? And your concept. So what would some design elements be that we've talked about? Embellishments. Okay, that's something that happens on top but that but let's talk about the what are the basic design elements first that we talked about what are the big three color color is one for sure texture let see, yeah let me see if i can do whiteboard with um oh no man i thought i turned my phone off sorry for a second uh just a second Okay, sorry, I my car is yet in the shop again, so I had to talk to the transmission guy. All right, I want to see if I can set this up so that we can have the whiteboard and maybe this, maybe this will work. Okay, no, that's not what I wanted, let's see. Thought I picked the whiteboard. Oh, this is getting weary, isn't it? All right. So let's talk about this. What are our design elements? Color. Color. We're going to put that down right here. Color. Where am I? What else do we have? Texture. Okay. Uh, because of the way whiteboard works, let's talk about these things as we go through them, okay? What, how can color show something about your design? Okay, how can it help you, how can it help you express the theme of a play? Well, we already know that color can help induce like subconscious um, associations with like other people. So like red can be like passion, but it can also mean danger. Like blue can be sadness, but it can also be like melancholy or like calm. Like 
So it can help express emotion. It can also help express dynamics if you use complementary colors versus opposite colors. So what we're going to say is it's one of the most obvious. Don't you think it's one of the most obvious design elements? Like, I don't think that the audience will say, oh, look, that person's in the red dress. We have to look at them. But there, it is something that will be clear to the audience. So it's a most obvious design choice. And exactly the things that you brought up, Kit, we have, we have color arrangement. And those things are analogous, right? The next to each other. Uh, complementary color are, is another way to do it, right? And we have monochromatic color. You guys have to help me with the, I gotta look up in my dictionary. I'm really terrible with spelling and I can't, um, I can't even Google it because I can't spell that well. I guess it's part of the dyslexia thing. So, Analog, I thought it was A, analogous color. That's not right. That's why I have my phone. So I, then I look it up on my phone. I do this nonstop. I think it's just an O after L, but everything else is correct. It's this, analogous? Correct. Okay, yeah. very good. So you have it, thank you very much. And we have complementary, and then that is, uh, complementary color is a cross on the color wheel, right? So all this goes back to the color wheel that we talked about, which is primary, secondary, and how they're related. And you know what this reminds me of is I just figured out why the tiers make sense that if purple is the worst, then we go to then we go to red, which is next to it on the color wheel, then we go to orange and we go to yellow because they're moving around the color wheel, right? So color is the most obvious. And exactly like you said, it is, it can be, um, it can be in terms of both the three things we talk about color, it can be hue, it can be value, and, or it can be intensity or saturation. Yeah, this is really bad. And now we can't go back, right? Oh. Nope. Shoot. Okay. I think I can draw a line through it. That's so weird that you can. Well, I just think it's probably that I don't know how to use the tool. Oh, uh, okay. But since I just learned this last summer, I mean, when I was, I had to learn it to teach. So before that, I never used this program or anything. And it's a, it's a really gigantic program. <laughs> so I don't know. I went to a five-week training. You know, there's still, they didn't really talk about whiteboard. So we have hue, value, and intensity. So remember, hue is the color itself. And certain colors have greater vibration. That's just the way you're physically, your eyes respond to it. Value is that movement between light to dark. And then with the most prominent part of the hue, the purest hue in the middle. And then we have intensity. And that is how far away, how contaminated the purest of the hue is to brown and on its way to the complement. Okay. So those are the three things that you can use for color. And it's something that is very clear to an audience. The next thing is line, and line creates, I'll capitalize it. Sorry, Pam. Yeah. Could you uh, say one, one more time the intensity? What okay. that was? Can you guys see the board over here? Yes. Oh, wait, I think I can do it this way. I think I can make an arrow, just a sec. Here we go. So intensity is from the hue away, not in uh, or towards 
complementary color. So it goes like this. It goes from here to here. Did I make, I make, I thought I was making an arrow, but anyway, it's the hue towards the complement. So if you have a chart where we say value, is the, the movement from light to dark. And here's your color in the middle. That is one way to think of it. Light through the color to dark. So color, and you can review the color lecture on this, okay? To white, you take the steps by adding it. But when you move the absolute purest of the hue towards another color, you lose the saturation or the vibration or the intensity of the color. You muddy the color up. So when you start muddying the color by adding another color to it, you're losing the intensity and you're taking it to another color. So if we have red here and we move to green, which is directly across the color wheel, we're going to lose intensity. Remember we did that, take one drop, the how much the blue overpowered the yellow. Does that make sense now? So you can review that lecture. Yes, thank you. You bet. And then line, what is the line? What does the line dictate? What do we have with line? So we have the actual costume. The, like a silhouette? That's exactly right. Now you're talking. We have the silhouette against the background. OK. And where is that? So that is a couple of things. I actually have this on my phone. I'm trying to type it correctly. Okay, so we have the silhouette. And there's two things about silhouette. We have the figure in space against the background, right? Multiple figures against the background. So if you have a very strong figure and a very strong hard line, outline, you're going to look at that character more. So silhouette can be the outline. And that's one form of line. Another form of line would be the actual thickness and thinness of the line. So if I have, and I we talked about that, let's say here I am. I'm wearing a lapel right here. If I put a black line around this, a piece of piping in my costume sketch, I'm going to notice the lapel. Why would I wanna notice that? And how can that show something about, let's say power? Well, we all know, we know that story about Joan Crawford. When we have shoulder pads, we get more power because we're wider here, that's closer to the face. If we have wide lapels and we show the wide lapels, that shows that we're going up to the face. So the audience knows where to look and they know that this person is more in power. If you have a soft or a um, hot, well, let's see, that's more of a textual statement. So I wanna try and, if you have a fluid line, or a broken line. Or a very strong line. Okay, 
So those are three other kinds. So you have a line that has a lot of movement, which is fluid. You have a broken line ch, 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 like that. So it gives you different information. And then you have a very strong line and that's more like the outline of the um, lapel. So there's a lot of things that line can tell you. And when we move from two dimensional to three dimensional, and we have, you know, we have a circle. This is shape. Let's go, sorry, I'm gonna see if I can. Oh, I don't know how to go back. I mean, maybe I can select this and just erase. Huh, I can just select the whole square. Okay, well, that's okay. I'll just put a box over here. So then we have shape. Okay, and that will be, we have our circle. We're just gonna put it right here, some weird way. I hope I can do that. It'll be a little bit off. So if we have circle becomes a sphere, right, in three-dimensional, shape goes from two-dimensional to three-dimensional, that's what we do. And then we have a a um, rectangle or a square. becomes a box, right, in three-dimensional, just a square can become a three-dimensional box, and a triangle And we just looked at a lot of triangles with our hen and headdresses becomes a cone. Okay, so you want to think about what is the shape of the object. So we have color, we have line, we have shape, and then Colby suggested that we talk about texture. And what is texture? So texture can influence line and we can have the soft or hard. The, the, the apparent texture of something is the appearance of softness or hardness within the costume. And that also repeats the same thing that we heard about line, which is fluidity. We also have what the texture also can be the surface appearance or treatment of the surface. For example, um, Diego showed us his swatch last time that had a gold, very fancy gold embellishment um, silk screened on top of velvet. So it changed the texture of the fabric. The velvet has a soft texture because it has loft, meaning that it is, uh, so there's some depth to it. And yet it has somewhat of a rigid line because it's heavy. But by putting that stencil on top, you're creating a different kind of texture and then you have hard versus soft together and you're creating a more rigid shape to it. So texture is the way something feels. How do your eyes tell you how this texture, how this fabric feels? Which is the tactile sense. So, you know, what is it when you're talking about lion and winter, what are the texture? Think about, don't say it out loud, think about the texture between Henry, John, and Alice. Just think only in texture terms. Who is hard? Who is soft? Who would have more fluidity? Who would have the uh, really rough surface texture indicating other kinds of rough cast, okay? So think about those things. So hopefully that is somewhat helpful. And then there are other 
sorts of design elements, but these are the major ones that you can talk about. Okay, other questions about that's your concept statement. Let's talk about well, the other things on my list here. And this is in form of review for the midterm. And you know what, I will try and give you a, I'll try and give you a midterm review checklist, which will ask you certain kinds of questions and will say no these things, okay? The, um, the midterm will be done offline. I mean, not in class and it will be multiple choice but you will have sufficient time that you can look things up. So I suggest that you take the time to read the question carefully, answer the question to the best of your knowledge. And then if you, but once you answer the question, if you don't know the answer, put it and you can take a look and make sure that you can actually see and look up the question, okay? So, what are the dressing lists? Remember, we talked about this with the Thin Man. Dressing list. You will be doing these for Lion and Winter. One of these works because I cleaned the board on purpose to make sure these would work. So dressing list. Okay. What is that? What's the definition of dressing list? Is it like a cross plot with the dressing? That's actually not a bad uh, description. So it is, so a cross plot meaning it's a spreadsheet, right? And with the dressing. So it gives you the items. So it can be a costume item list. You have the character, And when you get your, you do this often before you have the humans, but so you have a character first. And then you list their items. And before you do a fitting, you can do sort of a generic thing, right? You can create a generic dressing list. Let's, um, let me show you one. And Kara, you should have this information memorized from 131. Right, I'm trying to give others a chance. <laughs> All right, good thinking. So uh, let's just look at something and why this might be somewhat important. I mean, so if you're gonna create one without having the costumes built, there's basic things, right? Right. There's there's always basic things. For example, let's take a contemporary costume. Let's take uh, this is well. I was, I'll pull some up in a minute, but let's just take what Pam has on right now. Okay, so this is going to be a dressing list. So you guys, you're sort of looking at me, but what, what, first of all, the dressing list has a certain organization and there's a couple ways that you can organize it. You can organize it and maybe easiest for you from head to toe. When we start talking about a change list, which is also the next thing we're talking about in relationship to a dressing list, is we talk about those things are first that never come off. Okay, so that's a little bit tricky. Let's just talk about a dressing list. What does Pam have on right now? Well, she has on underwear. How many things do you think I have on? Like probably 10. You know, your dressing list is gonna be about 10 things. That's why our vocabulary generally lists 10. So I have on bra, I have on underwear, and I have on socks. These are things I'm never going to take off. I'm going to wear these for the entire show. Okay. And I, maybe that should be a different category underwear. 
Then I have on a, uh, I'm on a turtleneck. If I was gonna do this, I can say turtleneck. And if I know I want black, I can just say black. Okay. And then I have on a jacket that is ivory. It's like a jeans jacket, jean style. So you know based on your um, research what you want your character to wear. So you just put in these generic things. You want some kind of foundation garments. And sometimes we, I use the word foundation here. So you need some kind of foundation garments. So I'm dressed from there. Then I'm gonna have a, I'm gonna wear, what kind of trousers am I having? And I'm gonna have her wear black jeans. I'm gonna have some kind of a belt or what, then I go into accessories. Belt, I'm gonna say black or that word. And then scarf, you probably can't see that. Here it is, scarf, white red geometric with fringe. Now, why do I have to be so detailed about this? Because other actors could also have similar things, but if you don't have those things like with frills or something or with fringe, then um, it's gonna get confusing. Who else needs that? It helps the actor. The dressers. The dressers, okay. So I am wearing, uh, trainers, which are, um, we'd call them tennis shoes. Uh, yeah, tennis shoes. So if I was wearing Converse, I could put black Converse. If I was wearing, uh, you know, something. What else do I have on any other accessories? Yes. Then we put in jewelry, right? I have on a silver watch. It's a tank so, style. And then I have on earrings. Red triangle. Okay, is there anything else? I don't have any hair stuff. I don't have anything else. I don't have a pin. Oh, I do have on something else. So I have on an ID badge and that might be something that's also, a, you know, it's uh, also something that would be, um, you know, chain of order, some kind of other thing that you'd have. So I think that's everything that I have on, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 items. And if I had my scrunchie on, I would put that in there too. So there, this is a rough dressing list. I mean, this is a dressing list that's specific. A rough dressing list would say underwear and you need some kind of bra and socks. Hopefully they're gonna wear their underwear from home. We generally do not provide underwear. The rule with underwear is you provide it if you see it. So why do we provide a bra? Because it creates the shape of the body under the garment. So we do in fact see the result of it. Underwear, hopefully we don't see the result of it. Hopefully we never see what your underwear looks like, but if we need to see underwear on stage, then we would give them, sometimes we do modesty underwear, sometimes for both, for men in particular, we would do a dance belt if we're giving them something close fitting, like they're gonna have to wear underwear on stage and they will be completely exposed. We'd give them an, a dance belt underneath their underwear so that then nothing, there is no wardrobe malfunction. If you don't have socks, but you're gonna wear hose or stockings, 
you know, those are something in the thin man, we might have stockings with uh, men might wear socks or long socks with leg garters to hold their socks up. So there's all kinds of things with that, right? But this is the group of items that will never be taken off were I to have a second change. But I can put for a dressing list, turtleneck, jacket, trousers, belt, scarf, shoes, some kind of jewelry and leave it blank. And then I will, after I do my pull list and I find what I have and after the fitting, then I can fill this in. So that is an idea of a dressing list. What was your question? I thought, Kit, you had a question. I didn't have a question. Oh, didn't somebody say so? About yeah, I think me. Okay, Josephine. Uh, I was just wondering, like, what is the accessories? Is that jewelry and shoes? Or is that in the dressing list for, like, costume? Uh, I didn't put accessories in, I just put, uh, I put the items. So when I said, think about the accessories, that would be everything outside of the major garment. So it will include jewelry, it will include a scarf, it will include usually, shoes are sort of a basic, so I don't usually always think of them as an accessory because really we never have anybody barefoot. That's generally considered very unsafe on stage, it always promotes some kind of gigantic discussion. Uh, but things like handbags, gloves, hats, those are all things that can be considered accessories. But I don't write accessory, I write the individual item. Okay, so if I know that I'm in, for example, Thin Man, I will have hat, handbag, and gloves. I will write hat, handbag, and gloves, and then we'll fill in the color after those are determined. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. Okay. So how does this, what is, why is this dressing list so important? Because this drives all of your other lists. I mean, you might be doing this rough dressing list. I did a show, I think it was a show that was in uh, like March or April and I was doing the dressing list for it in November. The shop manager wanted the dressing list so they would have an idea of what might be possibly made to order what might be purchased. So this goes down to your procurement plan, right? How can you find what it will, how does it influence your procurement plan? Let me just see if, if uh... so here's a brief dressing list for Antigone. Let me just, uh, show you this as a representation. So Antigone, you know, was done here. Here's the dressing list for Antigone. Character name, actor name, the items. And you can see it's pretty basic. Undershirt, shirt, again, LSCA is long sleeve collar attached, trousers, jacket, self belt, belt, socks, boots. I knew I wanted them in Skechers. Hat, beret. So these were things that were basic. Waist sash, tie, and this is his crayon patch order, which would be like my ID badge. So I knew that this was white crew. And then these things I had an idea for, but then they were solidified at the fitting. Okay. So he had a tan shirt. I had two of them pulled to make sure we could get the right fit. He did have olive drab fatigue trousers, matching olive drab fatigue jacket, and he had an olive drab fatigue belt, self belt, meaning it went with the jacket. He also wore a leather belt to hold his trousers up. He wore black socks, he had green sketcher boots, he had a black beret, where there were multiple sashes pulled and we determined that he was wearing the multi-stripe waist sash and a black tie. So this is his dressing list, right? It's simply a dressing list. And I can post this as an example of a dressing list for you on your, um, I can post it on the um, Lion site so that you can see that's what it is. So then how does this work to fit in to my procurement plan? 
right? The next thing that I'm looking for is my procurement plan. And let's see what that would look like and how could I create a budget out of that? So if this is my dressing list, then I can find a procurement plan, which means procuring. How am I going to procure these items? So I'm using my same list like this. And I'm going to say, is it coming out of my costume stock? Am I gonna purchase this? Am I going to rent this item? Am I going to alter it? What is the time required? How much money does that cost me? Am I going to make something to order? Which I have indicated the waste sash might be made to order. Two hours. So the time that it takes, I'm going to make the tie to order, which is going to cost me $20. That seems crazy. I should have put that over and buy. And then my budget for my final costume for this particular thing is going to be $359.95. Okay. So this tells me how I'm going to locate and provide each of these items. And this is the designer's responsibility in conjunction with the shop manager. Because if you don't have a shop manager, you're doing it all yourself anyway. But this, this dressing list then prompts, how am I going to find that and how much is it gonna cost? I just had a quick question. Yep. If it comes from your stock, uh, do you take money from that or? No. So the stock, my costume stock is costume storage that we have eight miles away and we have our undershirts here. So that, that costs nothing. What can cost is if I have to alter it. Okay. So I have some suits for thin man, but if I have to shorten the sleeves of a jacket, that's gonna cost me $50. Oh, oh, okay. Right, because there's a cost and that's one thing that's very tough for people in academic to realize is because it seems like the cost is free if it happens in the shop. You're not, you don't realize that money is changing hands. But right now we don't have any shop support. So I am having to take every single alteration out to the tailor to have the tailor execute it. So I have to fit into their time frame. First of all, I have to fit the costume. I have to pin the costume. I have to then make notes about all of the costume alterations that need to happen, then that has to be delivered to the tailor. It has to fit within the tailor's time frame. Then it gets picked back up from the tailor. The tailor gets paid and then it comes back here and then it can be prepared and ready to go into the dressing room. Right? Does that make sense for everybody? That's why there's a cost attached to this. And, and oh, we didn't talk about this. This is in my other class. We talked about the um, fact that costume designers are considered a salaried employee, so we're not paid by the hour, but costumers are paid by the hour. So designers are salaried, costumers are paid by the hour. So they will get an hourly wage. And once they work over their eight hours a day, they get overtime. So for me to go pull things, it's free because I get paid if I'm working 10 hours a week or I'm working 100 hours a week. Okay, I get paid exactly the same. And I told this to my 106 class, so this is a repeat for you guys, but the, we, did a, we did a survey of all costume designers in the Costume Designer Guild about 10 years ago, before I moved, right before I moved to, up here. And um, it, the average number of hours worked per week for costume design was 72. So we're not working a 40 hour week. But if I go pull these things out of costume storage, yes, I'll get paid mileage to drive over there, but it really, you can't get over there and back. It's eight miles away. You can't get to Galita and back in an hour. I mean, if I pulled one hat, I might be able to make it, but it's pretty tight. By the time you get there, you get to your parking spot, you unlock the building, you go into the building, you turn on the lights, you pull the ladder out, you get the ladder, you take the things, you look for the thing you need, you get the thing, you go back to your car, you take the lights down, lock everything up, and then you get back in your car and you drive here. So it doesn't cost money 
for me to take something from our costume stock. It costs after we take it. I mean, even if I buy a shirt, I might have to alter it. I might have to move, right now we're moving buttons on the collar and buttons on the cuffs for things. If I rent the garment, which is exactly the same as getting out of my stock, I would do the same thing. I would measure the shoulders, I'd measure the chest, measure the waist, measure the length to make sure I'm getting it as close as I can, there would likely be something that needs to happen to it. That's why there's an alteration, min minimum alteration there. Now, alterations, if I put in $25, which is, that's just an amount. If I take alterations to a shop in Los Angeles, it's gonna cost me $46 an hour. The person that I use here is a little bit less than that but I have to think about that in terms of my budget, right? So that's why this very detailed procurement plan, where is this coming from? That's the procurement line. And then my budget line is really important because renting something plus the alteration changes my bottom line. And when you start talking about uniforms, Uniforms are very expensive because they're very specific. And let's say, uh, you know, you're gonna set something in World War II. There are people alive that know what World War II looks like. So they will be uh, hyper vigilant to make sure that you're doing a good job on that. Questions before I go off of the budget procurement page? You see how that makes sense to everything? I'm hoping, hopefully I'm seeing your hands say yes. <laughs> Thanks, Cassandra. One person, yay. <laughs> okay. So that's the procurement and budget plan. Now, that is one costume. What happens when you have a character that has to wear more than one costume? First of all, I'm gonna show you, before I do that, I'm gonna show you a check-in, check-out list with a one costume character, because this is more like what you're gonna do with um, Line in Winter, because it's essentially a one costume show. So when you're working with a, a show, and the reason why you're so detailed in that is that you will have costumers or dressers that come in that are not familiar with the show. They haven't been working with you for three weeks on this. They don't, their professional dresser or their student dresser, doesn't matter, we treat you all the same. And they come in, it's like it's the first time when they come into the orientation, they see the clothes for the very first time, okay? They just see, oh, so this is Nora, this is what Nora's gonna wear. They see them for the very first time. How can we best communicate to them what the character is gonna wear? Well, we do two things. We create a check-in, check-out list that looks like this. And look at that, amazing, right off of that silly little dressing list that we filled in, okay? So on the first day when we have our orientation and the, we have the dresser set up the dressing room so they touch the clothes. They touch them and they can identify them. Every item has a label in it with the name of the actor. And we do the name of the actor because often an actor can play more than one role. And so they may need a different costume for a different role, but that still would be their costume, okay? So when they set up the dressing room, there is this, and there is a photograph from the fitting of the character. So they're looking at a photograph and this check-in, check-out list. So they set up the dressing room and we have, I'll show you what the, uh, what, in a minute I'll turn it around and I'll show you how this works. They have a very specific area. It's separated by a name board, separated by a ditty bag and then their clothes go to the right of that. So they're gonna go down the list. Is his white undershirt here? Check. Is his shirt? Check. It's slash. Yes, trousers, yes, jacket, yes, whatever, okay? And then, when it comes back in after being worn, the X is completed. Now, why do you need that for every day? Well, what if there's laundry? 
So on November 15th, we were looking at, yes, undershirt, yes, shirt, jacket, self belt, whoops, where's the socks? Then we're looking for socks, okay? Then we're gonna look for the socks. And then, so that before the show, everything is in the dressing room in the order that the actor needs it. And that's the dresser's job. That's why check in, check out is so important. If we look over here the next day, everything is there, hooray. And after the show, whoops, the jacket and the self belt did not get back to the dressing room. So then the dresser goes, hopefully the actor's still there. Hey, you know what? Your jacket is not back in the dressing room. Do you know where it is? If the actor's already gone, the dresser is going with their flashlight to the stage. Oh yeah, I think he takes it off in act two. I wonder if it's still on stage. And then you retrieve the garment from stage so that you can bring it back. So that then, woohoo, the next day, everything is there. So this check-in, check-out list is the way that we have found to track the numerous items for every character. And you have a show that has one change, and this is one costume change for this character. So that's why the check-in, check-out list is so important. That's why when you know computers came in and we started getting Excel, it's like, whoa, we're not doing this stuff by hand anymore. Or we're not typing it and then having to change it when something changes color. I mean, it's it's really uh, you know, it's really was so, so time consuming. It still is time consuming. And when we talk about a show like um, a show we did a couple of years ago, which is Music Man, and we had 225 costume changes, you know, literally I was sitting at my computer to uh, have that, oh, years of typing up costume changes. You know, it just took so much effort. But then when you get to the dressing stage, when they're having, when each actor's playing five roles or they have five or six costume changes, it's hard enough for the actor. It's very hard for the dressers. But if you don't have that kind of preparation done in advance, you cannot have a tech that will be smooth. So we try to have dress rehearsals that work uh, really well and really conveniently so that we can um, just have them change their clothes. The actors know what they look like. They have their, um, they have their, uh, they have their list, they have their fitting photos, they see them in order. We post those on a board so they know here's number one, number two, number three, and they can see what that looks like. So I'll just show you one let me see if I have what is if I have something so that you can see. Here's a list of. Here would be a um, a section of fitting photos, so that you can see the kind of thing that they're getting. And this would be a character that's playing multiple roles. So this would be done in a fitting. And they, this is Brian, and this is his act one, scene two, and then act one, scene four, act one, scene seven. This is when he's the driver for the Wells Fargo wagon. This is when he is in Shapoopy, then he goes to this for four to seven, and then he goes to this. So those are his, his, those are his basic costume changes. So this is a fitting photo, this is rough, not everything is detailed in here, okay? But my purpose of a fitting photo is to try to give the director the most complete look that they're gonna get. But you know, we might, we're gonna take the creases out of the pants, we're gonna do different kind of buttons, we're gonna do something else. So not every piece of information is there, but it's enough so the director has an idea, this is how my show is gonna look. So this is a fitting photo, this is posted so the actor knows that in order of appearance, this is how they're going to appear. I'm the moving guy, I'm the town guy, I'm this guy, I'm driving the Wells Fargo wagon, I'm dancing like a banshee, and then I'm gonna end in 
this, okay? So that's, and then each one of these, I was just gonna see if I could find his dressing list for you so that you could see then how his change list works and uh, I don't know <laughs> if I have it on this computer. I think I typed them on the other computer, so I don't have it. But I will show you a dressing list so that you can just um, so you can see a change list and see how that works. Okay, this is one, we, we can look at a woman for a change. And this will, so this can inform you. And it's why we start in this class with a show that has a few characters with, a, um, with not a lot of changes so that you can understand the amount of detail that we need to go to. So this is, um, who is this? Okay, so this is Hannah. Everybody gets their own page on, uh, and that way it can be posted at their locker for the actor and it can be in the notebook for the crew. So Hannah is gonna start with her long line bra, her flesh mesh stockings, her modesty trunks, her modesty robe. This is, we, we often do this so that backstage people are dressed. If we have minors, it's a requirement that minors are different. So there's all kinds of rules that go along with people getting dressed. She has her wig, it also should say wig cap. And then her first change is her dress, blue-green geometric, which is a secretary. She has her belt, her heels tan, her earrings green cluster, her slip white, purse green, gloves turquoise, hat turquoise. Daisy pin on the hat, her slip navy. And then she has a costume change. She's wearing the blue-green skirt floral, the matching blouse, and the raincoat. Then for Paris Original, she changes into the Paris Original dress with purple trim, the earrings, the necklace, the gloves. Then for back to Cinderella Darling, this is an act two change. She, this is the, I think this is a check-in check-out list. That's why you're not getting the acts and stuff. So anyway, so this is her um, Cinderella Darling. She's putting only the dress on, the treasure chest. She's wearing, she's in the pirate costume, top, waist, sash, skirt, trunks, earrings, pads, blah, 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 and the finale. Okay, so that's why these lists are so important is so that your actors can track what they're going to wear when, the dressers know what they should be wearing at that particular time, but it's also the reason why we start out with showing you one dressing list, one costume, so that you can have things very clearly noted. I just wanted to see if I put change on anybody so that you can see what, um, what it looks like. So any questions about that? Does that make sense to people? Yes. Yes, okay. So here's a, a different, a little bit of a combo platter that I can show you where I've indicated the changes. So, you know, I'm not, I am not a robot and I'm not uniform, but, this is a change list that also shows the check-in. So for Leslie's story, we have act one, scene two, change zero. Change zero is what's never gonna change. So bra, the AO means actor's own, girdle, slip, pose. Change one, the black strappy heels, the blue dress, the corsage with roses, the maroon gloves, the handkerchief with floral design, the glasses on pearl chain, the jewelry with purple necklace and the pearl drop earrings, which actually the actor provided. And we don't usually have actors provide things because we don't wanna be responsible if they're lost. So they have to sign a waiver if it gets lost or damaged. And if you're crawling around on the stage, I tell you, you will ruin your clothing. Then her change two is the lavender nightgown, bathrobe, eggplant, slippers, navy wedge and the lingerie cap. Always her white wig and her white nude cap. That should be up here, right? Why did she not have it on in this scene? No, she had it. Okay, so those were her change. Then Leslie, this other Leslie had two changes, completely different. She's wearing goggles, helmet, 
blah, blah, blah. So these would be each individual pages printed out one page per actor. All right. So we have the dressing list that we've discussed. Yeah, that's bad. I can't see that. Okay, the change list. So that's where you have costume changes. The budget procurement plan. All based on the dressing list, right? That's the mothership. And then we have the check in, check out list. And these, these things are essential to have a smooth running show. These are the things that make the difference. The last thing that we need to discuss then is our petty cash. How do you account for the money that you spend? And even if you're working here and you're doing a show at City College, you will have petty cash or you'll have money that happens that, you've, that you hopefully have up front. You never want to be out of your pocket on this. And this is something that's very, very hard in terms of training employers. And it, it's, it's, I'm in a national conversation for costume designers for live performance. And we talk about how you can avoid using your own money. And one of the reasons that you say that is because if I am using my own money, then I'm investing in the show and you can make me a producer. So, but you do need to track this. This is like doing your taxes. If you've done your taxes, you understand how important every single receipt is. So these are things that are, that are very important that you need to be able to look at and you need to be able to verify, oh, this is what I've done. This is how my, uh, this is how every single penny was spent. So we can just look at this particular show. This is a modern show. And I can show you the kind of money that, um, the kind of uh, justification that I have, no matter where you're working, the employer is uh, deserves knowing exactly how it's spent, how the money is spent and where it went. So you need to create some format for that Again, this is, should look very familiar. This is an Excel spreadsheet, but every receipt that I'm gonna give in has a number. The date is specifically noted on that receipt by underlining, and it's noted on my sheet, the amount of the item and whether it was a an item purchased and then a complete return, I'm still gonna note that it happened because there's a transaction that has taken place. The amount of money that you have spent, so a plus or a minus, where the vendor, who where you purchased from, what for, okay? You're not gonna have to do this kind of a petty cash list. I'm just giving this as an FYI so you understand what is petty cash, how do you account for the money because this is other than, this is not your budget. Your budget is when you're doing it in advance. How much is this show gonna cost me? And this is how you're gonna get the money. So in this particular situation, it was uh, $1,199.25. I had received $500. I was out of pocket $699.25. So I was pretty sure that this employer was going to give me that money and I didn't stop the show and go back and say, I need another $500. I need another $600. And, and employers will often say, well, I can only give you this much money at a time. I said, okay, then in two days, I'll be back for this much money. So, you know, you look at the, you look at the density in which the money is spent from the 17th of October to November 5th. And you realize that you're really working in a, about a two or three week period. But uh, you need to be, every single item needs to be accounted for. So your petty cash 
is the way that you can account for every single item. And then you give this list with your receipts. You make a copy of this list. You make a copy of all of your receipts. You keep those together so that you make sure that your employer reimburses you for that. And it is in California labor law that you have to be reimbursed for expenses that are business related. So there's all that. And you have to sometimes re rely on labor law, unfortunately. So that's just a FYI. Petty cash is a way that you can um, justify your purchase. Your supporting document is the receipt. And at the end of the show, the employer is entitled to an inventory so that everything that you purchase that you have or you've done a receipt, you can show them on a rack. This is what it is. Okay. Questions about any of that stuff? See how important the dressing list is? It all starts here. That's why you have to do that. That's why those vocabulary words are important because you need to know, you know, if it's a tunic, if it's a sleeveless gown, is it a surcoat? You know, what is it? And using the terms helps both the crew and the actor identify costume pieces. So that's going to help going forward for Lion and Winter, and it's going to help for your um, midterm, and it's going to help you if you ever work professionally. And even if you don't work as a costume designer, this kind of organization will help you understand you need a paper trail for things so that here's where I think I'm going, here's how much I think it's I'm going to cost, here's where I think I'm getting it, and here's how much I spent. So those things happen no matter what kind of job you have. Any questions? Does anything come to mind? We're totally asleep because it's really, Pam, you've talked way too long. Okay, a little show and tell. I'm going to show you how we organize things. If we were in a dressing room, we would be organizing it this way, but I'm gonna just turn it around. So that you can see how we organize things for that check-in check-out list. If we were in a dressing room at this point, everyone would be have their own specific area, okay? So they may be on one bar, but there would be one person and a second person. They are organized in alphabetical order. So J comes before L, this is in first name. Their name is indicated by a divider on both sides. They have a ditty bag, which indicates their name again, where jewelry items can be placed, where scarves, things can be put on. We have the shoes here because we are transient right now. If we are in a dressing room, the shoes would be on the bottom and the shoes are labeled with the name inside, okay? Everything will be labeled. So the organization is that the name board comes first, then the ditty bag with the name, and everything else is behind that. Here's the undergarment. This is gonna be an additional undergarment to this person. Again, this is, this is based on the dressing list, right? The blouse. trousers, and the jacket, okay? So when this goes into the dressing room, this goes right in place. The actor's locker has a picture of them. Every item is listed and it's very clear so that when we do the checklist, we've got it all down. Does that, does that help you have a visual for what that checklist does? Yes. I like that, Odalis. You're always giving me the you're giving me the yes. That's good. Okay. Uh, that's just a that's just a practical thing for crew. And that's the way that we do it. And it seems to work very, very well. 
So that is the, okay, those are the three things that were on our, on our site for today to understand. And I will then upload those examples for you to put on to your line in winter projects so that you have those dressing lists and you understand what those are. Any questions whatsoever? We never took a break. So Sam. So I did an internship with um, one of the Circus Soleil shows. Yeah. And um, we had to wash each costume every single day. Yep. Which you think they would have used something like that or would they have had their own list possibly because i didn't i didn't get to look at that sort of stuff you were just on the laundry crew oh i was on technical crew so i just had to make sure the um the costumes got where they but i didn't get to yeah i had a friend that worked on iris she did all the procuring for them so uh yes so what happens is uh you know, every single show is going to have their own kind of organization. But when you're working with a big touring show and you're going to come to the Arlington Theater, for example, and by the way, you know, there are dressers that are hired by the Arlington Theater, just like there's carpenters. So the when shows come in, if you've taken the, the technical, the costume technology class, you'd be qualified to, to be a dresser there and then get in the union. But actors' equity and Cirque is covered under that if they're working a union show and they're actually, I think, outside of union. But Actors' Equity requires that skin parts, those things that are worn next to the body are washed every night, every performance. And that's why for our particular purposes, we usually have multiples. So we'll do two or three undershirts for men or pairs of socks. Um, if they're bringing their underwear from home, we, uh, we rely on them to take care of that skin part. And then same thing with dress shirts, we'll have doubles on dress shirts. For women, it would be their foundation garment. So for Cirque, it's usually some kind of a, uh, often it starts with a one piece unitard thing. Was that what, what you were washing primarily? Yeah, primarily it was, um, the show I worked on was Mystere. So yeah. luckily you didn't have to move around. And then were they hand washed? I'm pretty sure they were. Cause also we had to go through and check for damages. Because yeah. they and the thing about that kind of a show, which is heavily, the garments are heavily painted and dyed so that you generally hand wash so that it is less abrasive than putting into a machine. You can then uh, towel dry them and then hang dry so that uh, again, you're, what you're trying to do is reduce the friction of the machine or the temperature so that the color stays as vibrant as possible and then it's hung. So then they were all labeled inside. Then when the rack went back to the dressing room, they could easily put it in. And, and it depends on where you are in the process. So, and it depends on the crew that you have. So for me, I'm one of those weird geeks that, you know, I memorize everything. So I always know what everybody has. I always know that, you know, John's gonna wear the gray suspenders with the blue stripe with the gold trim, um, but not everybody does that. So you do need to have those safeguards of the lists. Yeah, good question. Josephine, you just start giving us a, what's a, you're giving me a shock face. Yeah, I thought it was cool that you memorized everything. <laughs> oh, ha. yeah, that's just my lunacy. You know, that's, it's, you know, I can't spell, but I can memorize everything. That's the way it goes. And if I look at the list like this, then I have it memorized. It's, I don't know, so my, just the way I am. That's why I told you I can't, I have to delete things out of my mind. That's why I said Bo Jackson's shoe size. I worked with him a really long time ago when he was a very famous uh, football player and he was doing football and basketball and baseball. But, you know, he's size 11 shoes, but I went to Nordstrom's and I selected shoes and then I did not check in the box. And when I got back to the set, I had one size nine and a half and one size 11. So ever thereafter, I have checked every single shoe size, no matter if the person checks it for me. Yeah because then I had to send a PA over to get the shoes and then they had to pull the other shoe and they were horrified. But nonetheless, you can't hold up the set. That costs, you know, probably at by now 25,000 a minute, but at that time it was $10,000 a minute. Okay, let's take a two minute break and then we'll talk about the midterm and the format of the midterm and any other questions that you have because we'll talk about what will be on it the full content, okay? 
So you can stand up and jump around and uh, go get a drink of water and I'm gonna get a drink of water. So it's 11.33 back at exactly 11.38 so that we have these, these uh, 20 minutes to talk. Okay, we're gonna go back and talk about uh, what kinds of things will be on the midterm. So we have to go back to ancient history, which is our, the beginning, <laughs> which we talked about. Uh, it'll be all of the reading. So you, by now you have read up through chapter five in the textbook. That is this, whoops, sorry. This book, right? So you have read through chapter five, which is final sketches. So there, everything that's in here, we'll talk briefly about what those are. It's the color of it. It is character analysis. It talks about the cross plot. So that will be chapters four and five. Also, I just wondered if anybody had a chance to look at the painters for costume design research, because remember well, that was one of the things for Lion and Winter, I said to look at the painters. So in this book, this is not gonna be on your quiz, <laughs> believe me. But uh, there's some great stuff because this is pre-internet, but they, they do list these great painters by time period. So let's say you wanna look at you know, 1250 to 1350, and it will list some painters, and that might be influential for you to look at for your design projects. So it's just something good to know, okay? So be sure that you review that, and I will put that on our, um, I'll put that on the checklist. So what are, the, what are the key points to chapters one through five? What's one of the first things that we did? The other thing you can do is you can look at our assignment list and say, oh, what are the, what are the first things that we did? Well, the first thing really that we did was we talked about script breakdown. So cross plot and what does it do and why is it important? That is gonna definitely be on there. Script breakdown and character analysis. Those are the couple of the first things. The very first chapter is called script, play script. So that's a really important thing to recognize, okay? And then we talked about character. Who are they? What are they? What happened before the play started? How do we determine uh, who's a supporting character? Who's a lead character? You know, all that kind of stuff, very important. The production. So the, the cross plot tells us when our uh, who are they and where are they in the play? What scenes might be kind of more important because there's more people in them? This, the costume plot, which is gives us the rough dressing list. That's where the dressing list comes into. What is period and style? How can that influence it? Then talks about labor, time and facilities, um, measurement. There's an information on a measurement chart and I just came across my measurement chart. I'll show you my measurement chart. I use this you know, almost exactly the same thing. So this is my measurement chart for Thin Man. I do this every single time. Okay, so a measurement chart. This is a measurement grid. It was where you list, this is in your text, but it, you know, it's your character, your actor name, and then the basic measurements across the top so that you have everybody on one page. I like it from small, <coughs> I have them in a very specific order from smallest to largest so that I can pull. And when I'm fitting, I know how to fit. I fit the largest to the smallest because you can always take things in. But that's what, that's another thing out of your reading that we talked about measurement, research, where you're gonna find research. What do you do for research? How does it, how does it impact your design? One of the things that I talked about was that you use a contemporary figure and you put the clothes on it because that helps a 
historical piece from being a museum piece and it becomes a piece where someone actually can be wearing the costume in modern days and all the different kinds of research and some what is the important thing sometimes you're going to show research on your sketch which we've done that what's the difference between primary and secondary sources and then sketch information how do you lay out the sketch what does it look like? What are you going to put on the sketch? Um, proportionate figures, which we talked about. Uh, drawing the proportionate figure. Uh, the elements of design, which we reviewed today. And then swatching. What's the purpose of swatching? Why is that important? How does that inform the sketch? Because sometimes we, you know, maybe you're, may, well, this is, I'll speak from my experience. My, I always felt like my sketching was hideous and bad, the worst possible thing ever, but my swatching was brilliant. So, you know, you, you can wow them both ways, whatever. If you have brilliant sketches, then maybe you don't need that. What are some tools that you're gonna use for those sketches? Like we talked about the kind of paper, that paper influences the end result. So that's basically all about your book. And, the lectures. <laughs> okay, another big part of our class has been the redrawings. So we are up through, I think, chapter three, I think. I thought it was five. Yeah, but I don't think five is going to be, that's this week. I don't think it's through, through chapter four, that's available till the 26th. Um, it's due on the 24th. So that's today, that's I gave you the information. So nothing, nothing after chapter four for sure. And I will give you a vocabulary list, all right? So that every, so that it won't be like 25 terms for each. I will give you a brief vocabulary list of things that you should know from each time period. So I will, I will winnow out the things that are, are most important for identifying. So that's what that's about. The other things that talks about in the labor book, though, are some influences on certain periods. So that's something that you might want to pay attention to. Um, there we will, I, you know, we will talk about, you know, the sketch as a communication tool, the collage as a communication tool, swatching as a communication tool, all those kinds of things. Um, what else? It will be multiple choice and there will be some short answer. Uh, you will only be able to submit it once. You won't be able to take it multiple times. Um, Will uh, it be um, wait, sorry. Uh, when, when will it be the midterm? The midterm is going to be posted like the quiz was. So it'll be posted and then you will do it on your own time, not during class time. And is it so, uh, going to be posted like today or something? Or? No, probably on Friday. Okay. All right. And then you'll have like five days. But it'll be the same thing about once you start it you you only it will be timed and so if you have an accommodation for time you'll get your accommodation don't all always that's built in but what i found was when i gave the quiz uh, people didn't actually take adequate time so when i allow two hours for the quiz and you take 15 minutes and then you're not getting 100 percent, i'm concerned so be sure that you plan the amount of time that the that the midterm says so that because remember it's completely open book you can look things uh, up. Is there like a study guide? Um, yeah, I'm, I, I just said I'll create a study guide for you. I have it right here. Uh, will it be in the modules? Will, it will be in the modules. And I'll, I'll put that in really clearly. There's a okay. midterm. Josephine, I see your hand. Just hold on a second. So here, let's look at. Let's look at this. I think I can go back. So this is the assignments, just a second.
so modules, right? And what is a redrawing? You'll want that, drawing the figure, script breakdown right here. Midterm, this is where I'll put the study guide. Okay, so week eight midterm, I'll put it right here. I could, we're actually on week seven, but I think since this says midterm, I think midterm study guide is best here. What do you guys think? That makes it, does that make reasonable sense that you'd look where it says midterm? Yes. Okay. So the study guide will be there and it will say, these are the things that this, that this is gonna um, cover. I'm not gonna give you answers, right? But you will say, these are the things I need to look at. That is also where the vocab list is gonna be on the study guide. So the, the costume term vocabulary list. Crossplot, it will also be a vocabulary thing, but it'll say, for example, it'll say, know what the crossplot is, how does that help you as a designer and what does it represent? Okay, Josephine, question. I'm, your hand is raised, that's why I'm asking you. Yeah, I had a question about the, when you talked about the, um, oh wait, let me see. I like it when I hear your pages turn because then I know you're taking notes, I'm so yeah. mad. <laughs> that's why, that's why I, that's why I texted you or I chatted with you, Diego, because I could hear you typing in the background. I said, are you taking notes? That's so impressive. Yeah, when you said that thing about when you're uh, drawing a figure and putting a paper on it uh, with the costume, I don't really understand how to do that. Okay, okay. That's not about the midterm, but let's just no. hold on that for a second and we can talk about that. You and I can yeah. talk about what that is. So um, any other questions regarding the midterm, but I'll talk to you about that technique. Um, so for the midterm, it is gonna be longer than the quiz. So there will be more questions. Yeah, it's 75 points. Okay. The quiz is 25 points. So it is gonna be, um, let's just say if I did 30 multiple choice at two points each, that would be 60 points and three short answer at five point each, something like that. Okay. Okay. I can't tell you what it is because I have not written it. I don't have canned exams. They are based on exactly what we cover in class. So that's, but it would be something like that format. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah, of course. Any, anything else? I will allow at least two hours for it. And if we were meeting in person, it, it would be a timed uh, exam that you would have to do during the time frame of the class. So we'll be doing that outside of class. So I can be a little more flexible with that so that everyone has the same amount of time. And then of course, if you have an accommodation, you have the amount of time that is approval. So no worries about that. That's easy for me to set up in Canvas because I set it up according to your accommodation and then it happens automatically. Okay, uh, Josephine, another question? Yeah, and this okay. is about the midterm. <laughs> oh, yeah, good. Uh, can you like uh, pause the quiz? Yeah. So like uh, if well, wait a minute, hmm, let me think. Uh, whew, now you're asking a technical question on the user end. Well, if you pause it, does the time keep going? Because there yeah, are. Oh, I, I figured out that's what she's asking the question for. Yeah, yeah exactly. Thank you. <laughs> you know what? Let me see if I can look at that right this second. Uh, um, hold on. Let me see if I can look that up. I, I can't remember if that's a choice or if that's a, like, let me see if it's a choice in the, set up or just a second let me go I'm, I'm just trying to I might need to have some help hmm. 
Hmm. Okay, just a second. Let me see if I can. I don't think it's an option in other classes. Like yeah, you, I they don't say you have to sit down and yeah, you know, hold on. Let me just out. grab this. I'm I'm looking at how they're made and seeing options that I have. Yeah, I think that the way that Canvas works, and I it doesn't, it's not an option for me, that um, the way that Canvas works is that once you start the quiz, it goes through that time frame. So plan the time. That's one reason why it's kind of great that you can do it on your own is you can plan a block of time when you can focus on that. You can have all your materials there, you've reviewed. You've done the midterm review uh, based on the study guide, and you've got your redrawings in front of you, and you have your vocab list that I'll provide so you know certain things that you need to talk about. And then you're ready to take your test. And it will be the time, I believe, does not pause. I I'm quite sure that's correct. Yeah, it doesn't. So, yeah, so if you have two hours and you're going to take it from, you know, 10 p.m. to midnight, then block that time out and you will have until midnight and then it will close the quiz. So, so you, you can go away and do something for half an hour and come back, but the time will have continued. Which is the way, I mean, I think that's important because it does mimic the way if we were being in person. And I have opted not to do this Proctorio of any of you taking a quiz like that, where you have to have your camera on and then your camera's watching you the whole time and then you're filling in your thing to make sure you're not cheating and all that stuff. So, but I do restrict so that you will not see the correct answers, right? You will, you will not know the correct answer until the quiz, until the end when the quiz is graded and parts of it will be graded. The multiple choice uh, quizzes can be graded. Um, so that you get them immediately. Anything else? Because if not, then you everybody can feel free to leave. And I'll talk to Josephine about her question about the how you, I think what you're asking about. So anyway, bye for now. I'm gonna turn Thank off the recording. You. And then I will.